In this short video, we're going to talk about measuring risk and return with some specific simple measurements, uh, the expected return and standard deviation. So to measure risk um, in this way, there's some elements that we would need to have. So we would know that need to know the distribution, the probability distribution of the return structure, and then we can calculate expected value, and from there we calculate variance and standard deviation. So an example of these concepts, if we think of it as a simple coin flip, there are two possible outcomes, heads or tails. And the likelihood of these possible outcomes with the fair coin is 50-50. And of course, probabilities must add to one. So in this case, the probability distribution says heads at 50% and tails at 50%. When we calculate the expected value of a distribution, we call this the mean, and we need the probability distribution to do it. In this case, the expected value tells you the center of the distribution. If you draw from this distribution over and over again, most of your draws will be close to the expected value. The expected value is really the sum of a products, and those products are each outcome weighted by its individual probability. And we add them all up, and we get an expected value. So if there are n possible outcomes, call them capital X1, 2, all the way to n, the expected value is simply the sum, adding up, each of these outcomes times the probability that outcome happens. For financial asset, the possible returns on the original investment are these possible outcomes. So now let's look at an example with two investments here. So investments one and two have three possible returns with probabilities attached to them. And so in each case, we can measure the expected return of these investments. And then we can also take a look at the variance and standard deviation, which will give us a measure of risk. So investment one, let's calculate our expected return. Three possible outcomes, weight them by their probability, add all three terms. So we see a negative 50% return has a probability of 0.2. A 0% return has a probability of 0.4 and the 50% return also has a probability of 0.4. And so when we do the arithmetic here, we come up with an expected return of 10%. Notice that 10% isn't really a choice here. It's not what can happen. But the idea is year after year, if we drew this investment over and over, we would expect an overall return to converge to 10%. Some years more, some years a lot less. Investment two has a slightly different return structure with slightly different probabilities associated with each possible return. Still, we can calculate the expected return the exact same way. So minus 20% at a probability of 0.25, a 0% return at a probability of 0.35, and then a 37.5% return at a probability of 0.4. Again, we do the arithmetic here, we get an expected return of 10%. So with these two investments with the same expected return, should the investor be indifferent? If you look at the two investments, there's no reason to think an investor would be indifferent between one and two, that they might have specific preferences. In particular, between these investments, there's a difference in the spread of the payoffs and how likely each payoff is. And so the worst case scenario is different in each case. In investment one, it was minus 50%. In investment two, it was minus 20%. The best case scenario was also different. And then the likelihood of the best, worst case, and middle scenarios was also different. So we need another measure here. Those investments have equal expected returns, but investors would not be indifferent between them. So we haven't measured enough to tell them apart. So our simplest measure of risk is one of standard deviation. And our first step here is to calculate something called the variance. And variance shorthand is a lowercase Greek sigma squared. So we calculate the variance, we're actually going to take each outcome, its deviation from the expected value, so we'll, we'll subtract the expected value, we take this deviation and we square it. And this is because all this will make everything positive, so we're adding up distances. We weight this square by the probability of that particular outcome, and we'll add it all up for each outcome. So a bit more complicated than expected return, because we're getting deviations from the expected return. So the expected return, oh, if we did this over and over again, it's where we end up. But variance is going to tell us, well, how likely is it that you are different from this expected return? And standard deviation will be the square root of the variance. Standard deviation is what's really helpful because notice the variance with the squaring, it's calculated in units squared, 
dollar squared, percentage squares. What does that mean? I don't know. But standard deviation will be measured in the same unit as the original probabilities and outcomes. So investment one. So investment one, the first possible return, remember, was a negative 50%. We'll subtract the expected value from that, the deviation, and then we square it to get the total distance and weight it by the probability, 0.2. Second possibility was a 0% return. Again, same thing. Subtract the expected return, square this distance, weight it by the probability. And then final outcome was a return of 50%. Subtract it from the expected return, square it, weight it by the probability. Doing this arithmetic, we get a 0.14, and we take the square root for the standard deviation, we would get 0.374 or 37.4%. Investment two, same process. Again, first possible outcome is a minus 20%, minus the expected return, weighted by the probability. Second possibility is a 0% return. Third possibility was a 37.5% return. We do this math, we get this for the variance, and therefore our standard deviation, we take the square root of this number, we get 0.237 or 23.7%. So in other words, we have an expected return, the center expected return is 10% for each investment. But we are now we get more of a range. We can go plus or minus the standard deviation to give us a likely range of where returns are going to fall. The lower the standard deviation, the smaller the range. Right? The smaller the range of likely outcomes, and we would associate that with less risk. So a lower standard deviation says that most outcomes are likely going to be very close to the expected return, and that reduces the uncertainty over return, and we would consider that less risky. Now, we have these two investments with the exact same expected return and different standard deviations. If we start by assuming that people are risk averse, we now have a guide to distinguish between these two investments. People do not like risk all else equal. That is the basic meaning of risk aversion. So all else equal meaning expected returns in our two investments with an expected return of 10%, investment two would be preferred by a risk averse investor. Why? because with the lower standard deviation, it's considered less risky. Keep in mind that risk aversion doesn't mean that people don't take risks. We assume investors are risk averse, and in financial markets, they take risks every day. The idea behind risk aversion is this all else equal. People will take risks if the reward is here. If there's a higher expected return on riskier investments, some people are willing to take that risk in return for the extra reward. In other words, all else would not be constant there because the expected returns are different. The idea of risk aversion is the idea that risk requires compensation. Risk requires that people who take the risk because we don't like it be compensated for doing something we don't like. But if the compensation is high enough, people will take all kinds of risks. So the risk premium, so given that risk requires compensation, the risk premium is a name that's really referring specifically to that compensation. It's the higher expected value given to compensate for the buyer of a risky asset. So for example, a subprime mortgage to a risky borrower versus a conforming mortgage to someone with a very good credit score, those have different interest rates. The subprime mortgage rate is going to be higher, and that higher, that difference, is the risk premium. It's compensating the bank for lending to a riskier borrower. Risk requires compensation. Again, I'm going to emphasize again, as I just said a couple slides ago, risk aversion does not mean that people don't take risk. It means that don't, people don't take uncompensated risks. So risk aversion means that people will take risk, but they expect to get something in return for taking that risk. Higher expected return is required if people are going to take on a higher risk.